Hi folks, today we're going to talk about writing an abstract. Every paper has a scientific abstract, and writing a good abstract is essential in getting your point across. Writing a good abstract entices the reader to read the whole paper, but also delivers the key elements of your work to readers that don't have time to read the entire manuscript. In this video, I'm going to go over some things to keep in mind when writing your technical manuscript. Perhaps the best bit of writing on the importance of an abstract comes from Kenneth Landis, who in 1951 was the editor of the AAPG Bulletin. In the July issue that year, he wrote A Scrutiny of the Abstract. This one-page essay lays out some important do's and don'ts regarding scientific abstracts. I heartily commend this to you. <clears throat> one of the things that Landis points out is the abstract is read by 10 to 500 times more people than read the entire paper. I don't know how these statistics might have changed over the intervening six decades, but this seems about right to me. This is particularly true given something that Landis didn't have to worry about, the internet. Most reading of the literature now occurs online. I mean, when was the last time you actually went to the library? You know, the big building on campus where they keep all the books? So, whereas many abstracts may be readily available, the entire paper may be only available behind a paywall. I recently had two different colleagues at one university email me asking for a copy of one of my recent papers. They'd read the abstract, but their university doesn't subscribe to that journal. So they couldn't see the whole thing. I was happy to send them a copy, and, and but I might not have get, got the opportunity if my abstract hadn't uh, made them want to read the whole thing. And even with a proper subscription, lots of people don't have time to read every paper that comes down the pike. So sometimes an abstract will have to do, even for interested specialists. So. The abstract needs to deliver the most important parts of the paper because this may be your only chance to make an impression. So, what's most important? In general, the motivation for a study is not as important as the methods used. The methods are not as important as identification of the field area, if it was a field study. The field area is not important as the results, and the results are not as important as the interpretations. How much each of these gets into the abstract depends on if there are limitations on how long it can be. Sometimes these limitations are very strict. Other times they don't exist at all, but even then the idea is to give a short version of the key points. But before I discuss some good and bad abstracts from Earth Science, let me illustrate the concepts by talking about a baseball game. The fifth game of the 2017 World Series was a classic with many ups and downs and a dramatic finish. Here are a few images from the last seconds of the game that give a small sense of the action. So. Imagine you didn't see the game, but having now seen these pictures, you want to know something more about it. You might ask a friend for some info. Suppose the reply came back something like this. The Dodgers played the Astros on Sunday night. Lots of hits, lots of outs. Both teams tried very hard. More games are scheduled for later in the week. It was the World Series. Now, I don't think you have to be a sports fan to recognize why this is bad. Everything in that summary we might call it an abstract, is true, but it lacks the essential part of what is needed in the reporting of any sporting event. Who won? After that, folks might be interested in other details such as what was the score, uh, which players had good games, and so on. Unfortunately, this summary of the game is rather close to the approach that is taken by some scientific abstracts, as, as we'll see in a bit. So, a better summary of the ball game would be something like this. Los Angeles 12, Houston 13, 10 innings. That's a bit spare on the details, but sometimes that's all that can be fit into the space allowed. So even though this description is very much into the whole brevity thing, it's much better than our previous example because it includes the winner. Other accounts of the game can include details of the scoring in each inning. Others will go into the statistics of individual players. But, as I mentioned before, Results are more important than methods, so maybe something like this distills the essentials better than individual statistics. This figure shows the calculated likelihood of each team winning the game updated as the game progressed. 
And we can see from this that by the fourth inning, the Dodgers had built up a lead, but the Astros came right back to tie the score in the bottom of the fourth. Similar back and forth swings were seen in the fifth and the seventh innings. But by the end of the eighth, the Astros led by three runs. But then the Dodgers scored three in the ninth, placing chances for the team at each team at 50% going into the extra innings. With the winning run scored by the Astros in the bottom of the tenth. The point of a summary is to bring to the reader an idea of the most important parts without having to go through every detail. Whether it's a five-hour baseball game or a 30-page research article. And this example communicates who won as well as some of the drama of the contest within a single figure. This is what's sometimes called a graphical abstract. It's the sort of thing seen in journals these days. Uh, Basin Research does it. Now, you should avoid writing your abstract until you've finished all the other parts of the paper. That's because you might not appreciate exactly which are the most important parts until you've formally described all your data and your interpretations. I mean, imagine writing a summary of this baseball game in the fourth inning. Of course, what's most important depends not just on the thing being summarized, but the audience it's directed to. For example, many reports of the 2017 World Series pointed out how great it was for Houston to have something to feel good about after the devastation of Hurricane Harvey only 10 weeks previous. And from the perspective of 2021, many folks in Southern California would say that the list of important things about this World Series must include a trash can. So audience is also a concern for your scientific communications. Are you talking to a group of sub-specialists in your field? If then maybe the methods used might get more attention in your abstract. Uh, are you writing for the general public? If that's the case, then you need to get rid of all the jargon that the specialists are so comfortable with and only discuss the broad implications of your work. Some journals now require a standard technical abstract and a second, more general, public-friendly summary. But no matter who you are writing for, and what you were writing about, authors of abstracts of scientific communications usually need to worry about length. Uh, an extreme example of a restriction on the length of a scientific communication is a weather report. Every day you might hear a radio on the radio an announcer mention the expected high temperature and the chance of rain. This is because radio formats often don't leave much time for the weather, so you need to get the important stuff in as fast as possible. Therefore, Today, we're expecting a high of 55 degrees and a 70% chance of rain. It tells you what you need to know. Just that quick, you know which jacket to wear and if you want to bring an umbrella. Local TV stations devote more time to the weather than radio stations, and so on TV, you'll hear not just about the forecast for tomorrow, but probably the whole week, and often some explanation about why these conditions are expected, and maybe the weather in other locations. Of course, there's lots more information that goes into making these predictions. The data and the models that use them are complicated, but that would take much longer than five minutes to explain all that. For STEM writing, it's quite common for there to be strict limits on the length of abstracts uh, submitted for talks at professional meetings. For example, uh, when submitting to the annual meeting of the Geological Society of America, where I go often, um, abstracts must not exceed 2,000 characters. 2,000 characters. A good abstract cannot be longer than 2,000 characters because that abstract is just not possible. Uh, some journals have limits as well. Uh, for example, the summary paragraphs, they don't call them abstracts, uh, for articles in Nature are restricted to 200 words. This sort of restriction can really force one to focus on what's most important and what can be left out. And the discipline learned under such constraints should be carried over to other venues. For example, papers in a recent issue of the Journal of Earth Science Reviews uh, were on average about 20 pages long, but these papers managed to get by with abstracts of just 400 words. That's short enough to be read quickly, but long enough to include some good details. Now let's take a minute to talk about a few things to avoid in your abstract. Remember that bad abstract I gave you for the baseball game? I made that up but it was after a pattern that is seen too often in actual scientific communication. I'm talking about abstracts that hint at the important stuff but never deliver the goods. Here's an example. The work presented here 
examines the effect of clouds and aerosols on actinic flux and photolysis rates, hydroxyl chain lengths, and the impacts of changes in photolysis rates on ozone creation and degradation, rates in a polluted urban environment like Houston, Texas. The timing of clouds is examined to determine whether morning clouds have a greater impact on ozone than do afternoon clouds. Case studies look into specific events to illustrate the impact of clouds and aerosols on photochemistry and also highlight selected recirculation and transport events. Whew. Your abstract should give the essentials of your work. This abstract fails to do this. We are given to believe that either morning clouds or afternoon clouds have a greater impact on ozone production, but we're not told which one. This is the approach of the barker trying to get you in the door. See the ozone production! See the case studies! But the point of an abstract is to not to tease. The point is to inform. The author of this paragraph clearly has some interesting information to tell us, but these sentences contain very little telling. Landis suggests that such abstracts are produced by writers who are either beginners, lazy, or have not written the paper yet. I can't offer you a better example of this abstract because in my rewriting, I would only be guessing whether morning clouds or afternoon clouds have a more significant effect on ozone production. This and all the other real news of the research are left out. We're left with a paragraph that's grammatically unobjectionable but scientifically empty. Keep this in mind as you write your abstract. Tell us what you did. Tell us why it's important. If you have to leave anything out, you can skip telling us how you did it. Students tend to be more comfortable describing the minutia as opposed to the key significance of the project. The minutia are important in the bulk of a paper but have no place in the abstract. Every scientific paper must have an abstract. Don't write the abstract until you have finished writing the rest of the manuscript. It needs to be a careful summary of the key points. Results and interpretations are more important than anything else. I cover writing abstracts and much more in my book, Communicating Rocks. The Amazon link can be found below. Uh, leave a comment below if you have questions uh, or requests for other topics about writing scientific papers you'd like me to cover here on this channel. Hit that subscribe button so you know when they arrive. Writing is hard work, but you can get good at it. Until next time.